my colleague from the NFL Network, Brian Billick, joining me live here on the Rich Eisen Show. How are you, Coach? I'm doing great, Rich. Thanks for uh, for uh, calling. You bet. Thanks for making the call on a, on a day where I'm sure uh, you have many thoughts about uh, your former boss and what it was like to coach alongside Denny Green. What was it like for you, Brian? Well, I just uh, and and I think I can speak for from any of us that have worked with Denny Green, both from a personal and professional standpoint. First, professionally, uh, I don't think any of us uh, would have had, and I certainly don't believe I would have had the success or be where I am with regards to what my professional career was or even I am today for work for Denny Green, not just in terms of the platform that he provided you, but the mentoring that he gave you. It, he was truly interested in helping you. And that goes back to the personal side, the kind of man Denny Green was. He was truly interested in helping you move along in your career. Uh, and he, you know, it's like the old saying, they, they don't care what you know until they know that you care. And, and Denny Green, whether it was with players or coaches alike, you knew that he genuinely cared about you, both pref, pro, uh, professionally and personally. When did you first meet him? It's interesting. Denny and I hooked up when I, I went to, the, uh, to Bill Walsh's staff administratively. Uh, I was on the administrative side, the PR side, oddly enough, uh, back when he first took over with the 49ers, uh, back in, I believe it was in 78 or 79. Denny was the uh, assistant special teams coach. So we were just two, you know, down the line type of guys that, that developed a friendship, played racquetball together. Uh, and then, uh, and then kind of went our separate ways. When I went down to, to coach at San Diego state and on to Utah state, Denny went on to become the head coach at Northwestern. You keep in touch as you do in any profession. And when he came back to Stanford, uh, reached out to me and offered me a chance to join him at Stanford. And that's where you first hooked up with him professionally. How, what, what's the genesis of Denny Green with Bill Walsh? Do you know that story at all? Well, he, Denny, Denny is obvious. Denny he was cum laude out of Iowa, a brilliant mind, hard worker. Uh, I remember at a time when, when African-American coaches were still trying to carve out a place for themselves, particularly those that sought to become a head coach. Bill Walsh recognized that talent. Uh, and, and saw very readily uh, and, and brought Denny in. Like I said, was at Stanford. I think he gave Denny his first job, uh, or I should say the first job. Bill Walsh was at Stanford, took him with him up to the 49ers. And, and, uh, and again, and I think, and Denny, I think, would, would have told you that, that Bill, and that's where maybe Denny developed some of that perspective. Bill Walsh was very much very genuine about helping his coaches move forward. So I think Denny was appreciative of that was able to kind of pay that forward and drew many of those same concepts uh, from a Bill Walsh that he applied in his own career. Brian Billick joining me here on the Rich Eisen Show. So how did it all come together in 1998, Brian? How did that all work? Well, and, and I, people, uh, I, I'm not sure people were fully aware of just, to me, Denny Green's biggest single strength, and there were many. He had a great offensive mind, great mind for the game in general, very well organized, but in all my years in this profession, I don't think I've, I've been around another coach that would had such an intuitive understanding of players, both in terms of their abilities, his ability to uh, isolate and find talent, whether it's in free agency, whether it's in the draft, whether it's the talent you have on your team, uh, the finest personnel guy uh, in the coaching ranks that I've ever been around. I remember time and time again, Denny admonishing coaches during say, the course of the season or even getting ready for the draft. Don't tell me what a guy can't do. I know what he can do. I can see the darn film. Tell me what he can do. Tell me what we can tap into to make this a better football team. And that was his secret. He always he found something in every player that could help that football team. And I always thought Denny, after he was done coaching, would have made an incredible general manager. You know, and the question is, is well, what did he say to the team after after the NFC Championship game loss? I mean, what what how did he handle that one? Brian. That was the thing with Denny, and keep in mind, Denny was as competitive, as had as much conviction, uh, a passion for the game as anybody I've ever been around. But he also had a huge capacity to move on to the next thing. And I'm not going to say dismiss it because that was very hurtful, as it was when they lost in the championship game in New York at the time. I was I was really looking forward to that rematch with Denny and the Vikings in our Super Bowl uh, when they went into New York and were heavily favored and, and, and New York uh, was able to beat them soundly, uh, surprisingly. I think those two losses were very tough on Denny, but Denny had the kind of personality to, to move on with it. He, he always used to say, this is what we do. It's not who we are. When I was with him in Minnesota, he, used to, he had a huge passion for fishing. And during the season, if we won, 
he would allow himself at 4 o'clock in the morning to go out and fish for a couple hours hmm. on Monday morning. <laughs> if we didn't win, he'd, and, and believe me, as a coach, you didn't want to be around when he couldn't go fishing on Monday for a lot of different reasons. <laughs> uh, but that was Denny. He had, a, he had a way of compartmentalizing it. As I said, huge passion for the game. Uh, I'm not saying he dismissed the losses, but he was able to move on and move on to the next challenge. Brian Billick joining me here on the Rich Eisen Show. Uh, before I let you go, ask him the poll question today, Chris Brockman. That's available to be voted on on our app that you should download right now. Go for it. Which one of these NFL players will their team miss the most during the first four weeks? Tom Brady, Le'Veon Bell, J.J. Watt. What do you think? Oh, boy. You know, how do you not any of those? And, and particularly uh, a, when you're talking about Tom Brady. But I think in terms of the structure of the team, I think Le'Veon Bell, that's a huge hit for Pittsburgh uh, and the pressure that that then now puts back on, on Ben Roethlisberger. I don't know if Houston's a championship caliber team yet. Uh, I think Pittsburgh is. So to have that start, but Tom Brady and then Garoppolo, you know, you just, you have faith in the bill Belichick. You figure they're going to figure it out one way or another. But if I had to say, I'd say lady on bell. Well, didn't, but didn't the Steelers kind of figure out out with D'Angelo Williams and uh, even Fitz Toussaint when it got down to that, uh, level, they were able to, I guess, stay above water with Ben firing it to Antonio Brown. Yeah, and I think they will. Uh, just like I think somehow New England will find a way to win, and obviously Houston and, and the Challengers have got a quarterback now, Brock Osweiler. They think they'll have more offensively. Uh, but but Le'Veon Bell, uh, and, and I think you know they'll be able to put a total composite team together and maybe overcome it. But in terms of direct you know, yard for yard, play for play, the pressure it puts on the rest of your team to not have that guy. I, I, partly because I think Le'Veon Bell is the best running back in the league no, right now. No doubt. Coach, thanks for the time, and I appreciate uh, your thoughts on, on this day. Appreciate it. Sounds you great. Bet. You bet. Thank you. That's uh, Brian Billick. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern on Audience.